Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. Today I want to talk about presentism. Presentism. What do we do with men like Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield? Men who have been respected in evangelical, reformed, conservative circles for years. And now their status is being called into question because they own slaves. They did not hold to egalitarian ideas our current culture takes for granted. Do we cast them aside? Do we stop respecting them? Do we call them hypocrites? Do we still learn from them? I think we're going to need to ponder this in the Christian community because if you have not faced this challenge, you will. Trust me, you will. Uh, In fact, if you're not even a Christian, if you're just an American or someone who values your Western civilization, you're going to need to think through this too because all of these things are under attack right now. Now, I think we are in the middle of what I'm calling a postmodernist controversy. I want to get all my cards out on the table first before we get into Edwards and, and Whitfield. And I, I want to, to tell you what this means first because I think it's important. The modernist controversy happened about 100 years ago, and disciplines like evol- science, uh, higher criticism and literature, uh, these seeped into evangelical institutions, places of higher learning. And the fundamentalists who formed during this time, the conservatives, they said, uh, you're ushering in a new higher authority. We believe scripture is the higher authority. Revelation is the high authority that we believe in. Uh, what are you doing putting man on this pedestal and saying that through his scientific investigation, he can find truths that contradict the word of God? Uh, that we don't, revelation is what dictates what is true before man does anything like that. Those who were on the progressive end of this, who kept these institutions, the fundamentalists basically took their resources and went and started new ones, they did not think initially that they were doing anything to threaten the gospel. In fact, they probably thought that they were helping things. We're going to make Christianity intellectual. We're going to make sure that these disciplines are integrated with Christianity. Today, we have, I think, a similar situation, but we're not used to being attacked from the angle in which we're being attacked now. So with the social justice movement, instead of these uh, modernist type objective uh, type of disciplines, you know, from science coming in and creating an issue, it's actually disciplines like history and sociology that are coming in. And we see this in a lot of the words that are being used. Uh, Cultural engagement is is a word that's used over and over in SBC circles, and uh, human flourishing is, of course, used uh, quite a bit in uh, um, Presbyterian PCA circles. And, uh, you know, other terms like just white privilege, systematic racism, you know, these things are coming in from places outside of the Bible. And then they're being used to integrate with biblical ideas. Or, you know, in the case of justice, we take a definition that is not biblical and then we read it into biblical texts. And we haven't had to face this challenge, I don't think. Uh, not, Not coming from this direction. Now, since we're talking about history, I want to talk about history for a moment. So Howard Zinn, People's History of the United States, his followers from the 1960s onward, like Eric Foner, they have a postmodern undercurrent in their approach to history. Because what they essentially do is they say, you know, there isn't like an objective truth going back in history. I mean, history classically is historians were people who went back and they investigated, tried to find out what the truth was before they ever tried to ask the ought question, they asked the what question. Well, Howard Zinn and the gang, you know, they look at history as kind of through a Marxist lens, that um, the truth is whatever, it's kind of like a might makes right. Whoever has the privilege, who uh, ends up controlling finances and institutions, they end up telling their side of the story, and that's been the truth. And we need to stop that. We need to instead tell the story of these aggrieved minorities and, and, um, and people who were oppressed and, and they're going to have their day to tell their side of the story. And so we're to the point now where in secular history, it's essentially become 
a discipline where you go back into the past, you cherry pick the record for whatever makes the oppressed look good, the oppressors look bad, and and that's what and you tell that story. And and truth is not as important. Finding out what actually happened. So I'm not denying that there's an ethical component in history. In fact, I'm affirming that. I'm saying yeah, there is an ethical component uh, that drives the way you're going to do it. And in Christian circles now, there's an ethical component that has seeped in from these other disciplines. And I think it's we're, we're largely unaware of it. We don't see it initially. So, um, of course, in the secular world, right, we have, like, for instance, the monument debacle where uh, we're going to reinterpret historical artifacts or, or we're going to, um, you know, erase monuments from the landscape. Uh, well, that's happening at Christian institutions now. I, a couple weeks ago, I found out that there was a prominent Christian university that had a mural of William Shakespeare, and they altered it, painted over some things because he was a white man. He had white privilege. So these, these things are coming in, and we need to know how to deal with them. So I want to talk about uh, some of the perceptions out there of Edwards and Whitfield. Uh, these guys have been heroes for a while to people in the Reformed Evangelical camp. But uh, we'll start with Tabidi and Abile. He said, and this is seven years ago, I regard Edwards as having sinned against God and his fellow man as having owned slaves. Now, let me ask you, I'm not going to answer this right now, but let me, let me ask you the question. Is it a sin in and of itself to own slaves? Think of all the people that own slaves in Scripture, that we're not corrected about it. Think about what Paul says about slavery, what Jesus said about slavery. Uh, is it a sin in and of itself? Now, you answer that in your own head. Tabidi went on and he goes, you have to understand Edwards in his time. You have to take into account his blind spots. Now, I appreciate that. That was seven years ago, though. I heard him say something similar about both Edwards and Whitfield a year ago. He didn't say the same thing. He didn't say, he didn't give a caveat at the end. So I think the tone is changing. Now, speaking of tone, Kyle J. Howard, a year ago, this is during MLK 50. Uh, he's a social justice advocate, uh, evangelical. He said, I am more confident in Martin Luther King Jr.'s conversion uh, than I am of Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield. Um, out of the three, he's the, his life was the one marked by divine love and the pursuit of biblical justice. And then he goes on to say, Edwards and Whitfield lived an unrepentant life of man-stealing. Uh, they were heretical, demonic, and evil. So it doesn't sound like he thinks they were Christians. And they participated in a system of legalized rape of women, torture, murder, sexual abuse, child rape, etc. It was a system that you know, made Roman slavery look you know, like it was nothing, which... I don't think he's getting this from reading anything. He's not reading uh, Eugene Genovese, Roll Jordan Roll. He's not going back to the slave narratives to find out what uh, they said, slaves themselves said about uh, their situation. Um, I don't think he's reading Roman history. It looks like he's getting it from somewhere, though, right? And, and so there's this condemnation of Edwards and Whitfield here and this elevation of Martin Luther King Jr. Now, I want to talk about Whitfield and Edwards and then give you kind of my take. So let's survey these guys uh, when it comes to slavery and race and so forth. So Whitfield. Whitfield, and, I, and if you want to go see a, a source on this, it is slightly to the left. It's slanted that way. George Whitfield on slavery, some new evidence. Stephen J. Stein uh, has some of this information. Now, I've read Thomas Kidd and other people on Whitfield, though, so I might pepper some of that in. But Whitfield, throughout his ministry, put blacks on an equal spiritual plane with whites. So he ministered to them. He shared the gospel with them. Uh, he believed that they were just as capable of salvation as their masters were. Now, in 1739, there was a slave rebellion uh, in the Stono River area in South Carolina, and Whitfield is there in the next year, 1740, and there still has been some attempts at rebellion since then. And, and this is at a time, you got to know, about twice as many blacks live there as whites. So Whitfield in 1740 is journeying to Georgia from South Carolina, and he find he, he comes across some blacks who seem out of place, and he gets anxious about it. He just doesn't know if their intentions are right. And and some have said that, well, look, he, he's racist. Not necessarily. Um, if you take into account what happened in 1739, he is he's nervous, uh, but he doesn't know, and he is reading into this what had just taken place. So. Um, so, so I, I think that relieves some of that tension that some may feel. But let, let's move on. Let's keep looking into Whitfield because we haven't gotten to the main thing that people demonize him for. 
1740, Benjamin Franklin, his publisher in Philadelphia, publishes to the inhabitants of Maryland, Virginia, North, and South Carolina. And Whitfield's traveling through these places, so he publishes this book, and it's basically an open letter to them. And he says, As I lately passed through your province, I was sensibly touched with a fellow feeling of the miseries of the poor Negro. So he's identifying with them. And he said, God has a quarrel with your abuse. And he's talking specifically about slave masters who would abuse. Your abuse of the cruelty to these poor Negroes. He said, some masters are no better than monsters of barbarity. And the blood of, of these slaves uh, that was spilt will be used uh, against them in heaven. And, and the only thing that was worse than this physical, uh, physical sin in his mind against these slaves uh, was the fact that there were masters that did not Christianize them. They didn't share the gospel with their slaves. And so what Whitfield does is he tells them, look, share the gospel with them. Christianize them. In fact, That'll make them better slaves. Now, he gets flack for this because, well, how can you say that they'll be made better slaves? Well, in Whitfield's mind, he's just repeating what Paul says. Slaves, obey your masters. He's just repeating scriptural imperatives. And his goal is, I mean, clearly, if you read this letter, his goal is their condition. Let's move on. Uh, 1747, 1748, this is where Whitfield gets in trouble essentially with modern people. Uh, he has an orphan house in Georgia. It's in financial difficulty. Some folks in South Carolina say, hey, why don't you start a plantation here? We'll give you some slaves. You can make some money. You can get out of your financial difficulty. So they do that. And then Whitfield says, you know, I want to bring some of these slaves down to Georgia. I want to bring them to the orphanage. And, and he even says, I've been held back because of white hands. And that Georgia won't be flourishing unless Negroes are employed there. So he has a very high view of the work ethic of, of black people. Um, but he gets in trouble here in the eyes of modern people because he's the one that is, he's the most famous man in America, and he's petitioning Georgia to allow slavery. How can he do this? Now, I'm going to throw this question out there without bringing any moral judgments yet. I'm saying anything, really. I just want you to think about this. Because there's a lot of things I think when it comes to presentism, there's a lot of things we overlook. Uh, there is an ethical dimension to presentism. Are we judging the past by standards that come from, if you're a Christian, the Bible? Or are we judging them by the standards of our time? Just what people think in general. Uh, as I was saying before, the discipline of history has, has a postmodern undercurrent today in the way it's practiced. Part of the discipline of history today is it, it is telling the story, this is the Marxist kind of component, of the uh, egalitarian nature of man or the, the, the egalitarian um, uh, uh, you know, man freeing himself from the chains of, uh, uh, that constrain him and being equal in every way. And, and history is that story. The history of the world is that story. Man is freeing himself to be more egalitarian. We're going to have this utopia. And so even the history of the United States becomes a history of, of uh, less equal to more equal. And it's all about our fight for equality. Uh, and, and you can see this in every single, I mean, it's not just with, with regards to race, it's in regards to sex and orientation. And it's just, so it, it gets into everything. Now, are we judging Whitfield by this idea that, well, look how, look what a caveman he was. He was way behind the curve. You know, he should have known this. Um, that was wrong. And when we say it's wrong, is it wrong because we have a chapter and verse, or is it wrong because the what our modern current age tells us is the standard we're operating by? Now let's review for one second. Whitfield put uh, uh, slaves and masters on the same spiritual plane. He was very strong against masters who abused slaves. Um, and, and so he was against that. Uh, and then we have this thing where he essentially uh, allows or introduces slavery, helps introduce it into Georgia. And, um, but he believes that slavery should be guided by a Christian principle. Uh, and so, so this, is, this is who he is. 
you know, trying to be as nuanced as I can while giving this to you in a brief, short form. So let's get, let's go on to Edwards and we're, we're you know, hold that, whatever thoughts you have, hold those. Let's talk about Edwards and then let's, let's bring this all together. Uh, Kenneth uh, P. McKema, uh, Edward, Jonathan Edwards on slavery and the slave trade has some information on this that surveys some of this stuff. Um, he owned at least four slaves during the course of his life. He did not draw metaphysical differences between race, though. Uh, he thought that just like Whitfield, um, in fact, he, he goes a step beyond Whitfield because in the 1730s, there were Native Americans and, and African Americans becoming slave, uh, becoming saved, not slaves, saved, they were becoming slaves too in some ways, but they were becoming saved in joining churches. And Edwards in 1739 basically says, I'm looking forward to the day that Native Americans and African Americans are going to be writing, they're going to be divines and they're going to be writing excellent theological works. And, and this was his hope. So not only does he think that they're equal in, in the sense that they have the same problems that everyone has, sin, and they have the same solution, salvation, he says they, they can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with us intellectually. Why not? So, so that's Edwards. Uh, now, the only document that we have where he specifically talks about slavery is a draft. And he's writing to defend a minister. Some people think it was him. And he's being, you know, this minister, whoever it is, is being criticized by the congregation for owning slaves. And he condones slave ownership. He does. But he also condemns the slave trade in this, which is interesting. He acknowledges its inequities and disturbing implications, but he takes ownership. Uh, he, he takes a, sorry, a providential view of, um, of the institution. So it's a necessary evil. And it serves some positive good in God's decree. So remember, he's the Calvinist, right? So he's saying God's got a purpose for this. He's Christianizing some people that wouldn't have received the gospel. There, there's something going on. Now, uh, he believed that holding slaves was permissible as long as they were treated humanely, which is what the law of Massachusetts also required. He points out the hypocrisy of those who profit off of slavery, slave products, while condemning it. And he says, for if they continue to cry out against those who keep Negro slaves as partakers of injustice in making them slaves and continue still themselves, notwithstanding to be partakers of their slavery, let them own that their objection are not conscientious, but merely to make difficulty and trouble for their neighbors. So he says, you guys are a bunch of busybodies. You, you don't really care about the condition. Now, remember that the word condition uh, with, with Whitfield and with Edwards, they're concerned about the condition of slaves. The, today, though, uh, word difference here, today in our egalitarian age, the thing that matters, it seems like, is status more than condition. Well, they, they, they couldn't vote. They couldn't, there's things that they couldn't do that other people can do. That would not have been on Edwards and Whitfield's mind. They, it just wouldn't have been a, a thought as much. They lived in this hierarchical culture, and um, it, it just, it wouldn't have crossed their minds. Now, were there were the seeds for getting rid of slavery planted by Christians during this time? Yeah, they were. I mean, the idea that slaves and masters are on the same spiritual plane really did help end slavery. But uh, was there specifically biblical passages that they could look to that were clear that said, this is evil, this is wrong? There weren't. And, and so they operated within the time that they lived, as men of their time. Uh, now, Edwards also opposed man stealing uh, based on biblical principles. Again, he limited the purchasable slaves to war captives, debtors, and children of slaves. So he's, he's reaching back into the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and he's saying, this is, we should operate by this. His son did become an abolitionist. So, um, so it, I just think that's interesting that his son did that. Uh, one more thing when it comes to Edwards. He's often called a racist because of some comments he made about Indian cultures because Edwards became a missionary to Native Americans. And he uses the word Indian here. He says in a letter to William Pepperell, he says, Indian languages are extremely barbarous and barren and very ill-fitted for communicating things moral and divine or even things speculative and abstract. In short, they are wholly unfit for a people possessed of civilization, knowledge, and refinement. Now, is that racist? Or is he saying, the context here is, he's giving 
pepper pepperell uh, advice on educating young uh, Native Americans is he uh, is is he saying they need to learn English that is what he's saying he's saying they need to learn English to get these theological truths down and they need to comprehend them it's not just enough to just make them memorize sounds they need to comprehend and he's saying you, you can't do it in their language I don't know enough about the language to to know whether that's true or not but is that in and of itself a, a racist or you know ethnically superior thing that he is saying it, do, it doesn't sound like it now maybe maybe it is strong language um, you know but again this is the man who also thought that there's going to be a time when when Native Americans are writing these theological works that you know he's looking forward to it um, so he becomes a missionary to the Indians and his um, his son William Pepperell uh, oh, sorry that's not his son that's the letter he wrote his son um, uh, junior Jonathan Edwards junior he becomes an a abolitionist and he learns these Native American languages when he's working there so uh so that's edwards that's edwards that's whitfield and you know there's not like a lot uh of information we have about them in regards to this that's pretty much i mean i'm surveying it but that's pretty much what we have now martin luther king jr um is being you know has been criticized by the conservative side as why are you grandstanding this guy I mean, you can look at my video where i talk about that and i say there's good things about about him i have a dream speech is good we don't cast everything away um but as far as making him this hero why would we do that you know paul talks about people who followed christ as being you know, it doesn't look like mlk followed christ well mlk directly breaks the commands of god he's an actual heretic and the criticism against him is not a criticism using presentism we're not saying hey, it's 50 years later, and now we're looking at MLK and we're saying, well, you know what? He's not up to snuff. You know, we, we now believe that adultery is wrong, whereas in his time, you know, he didn't know better. Well, that's not what we're saying. We're saying there's biblical standards that he broke, and we're saying that he had a pattern of this. He was unrepentant, it seems, at least, and unless he had a deathbed conversion, it looks like he didn't believe in the divinity of Christ. We're looking at the Bible as our standard here. Now, what do what do we do when we look at Edwards and Whitfield? What does the left do? They are they looking at the Bible and saying, okay, here's what the Bible says about slavery specifically, chapter and verse, and uh, and they didn't meet it. Or are they also, or just taking principles from the time period in which they live, things that we just take for granted, egalitarian ideas, and then imposing that on them and demonizing them. I'll let you answer that, you know, or is it, is it a ratio? Is it some of biblical principles, but also, you know, egalitarian things from our culture, you know, on what standard are they demonizing Edwards and Whitfield? It's different than the standard that's being used to caution against MLK um, and, and grandstanding him, so to speak. Now, um, everyone has human failures, right? There's no one perfect. God is in the habit of using people with failure. And um, there, there seems to be more grace given to those who are more ignorant of their failures. What do I mean by that? Luke 12, 48. This is, is interesting to me. I'm going to read it for you from my assault Bible here. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. If you're given more, more is required of you. Was Ed, were Edwards and Whitfield given the same information that we're given today? Did they live in a culture in which it, it was multicultural and they could see firsthand walking around that wow okay there's every shape every color every um, culture seems to have uh, you know they're capable they can do all these things or did they live in a world where well edwards you know missionary to uh, native americans you know did he you know did he just see maybe the outworkings of a pagan worldview uh, could he have potentially misassociated that with uh, genetic differences and so forth. So, so that's something that we have to take into consideration. 
Did they have the scientific advances that we have today that show um, the similarities between people? They didn't. So they didn't have as much light as we do um, as far as, uh, if you want to say, equality and, and, and the similarities between people and the capabilities of, of people of different, um, of all sorts of, of ethnicities. So the interesting thing to me, though, is when I looked up this passage, Luke 12, 48, I remembered the verse. I forgot the context it was in. This is about being ready for, uh, for Christ when he is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Slavery, though, is the template upon which this parable is drawn. Let me read for you the verses preceding Luke 12, 48. And I'm making a point, so listen up. Verse 45. But if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour that he does not know. And he will cut him in pieces and assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave who knew the master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it and commanded deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. From everyone who has been given much, much will be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. If Jonathan Edwards or George Whitfield said that exact section that I just read, what would social justice evangelicals say about them? Hopefully you get the point. If we use presentism, if we use standards from the present to judge people of the past, we destroy our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's reputation. We destroy the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the church fathers, the reformers, if you're an American, the founding fathers, etc. We will not escape that destruction ourselves. Let me give you some examples. I'm going to start on the conservative end. If you are a Trump supporter, and let's say you supported Trump because you were against illegal immigration and you didn't think Hillary Clinton was going to handle it. Let's say that was one of your reasons. And 50 years from now, your descendants are sitting there in uh, school or 100 years from now, and the, you know, the CNN archive has been used to write the history books. <laughs> And, uh, and they know that you have some quotes you wrote down, you know, that you voted for Trump or you were supporting him. And, and now they think that, well, Trump, you know, is what CNN said he was. He's, a, he's just racist, and it was just about white supremacy, hating Hispanics. Is that fair? Is that fair? Now, it's not a stretch to say this. We are seeing this play out in the present. But let's say we're 100 years down the road, and everyone just takes for granted CNN's uh, view on this. Is it fair to, and that's the new compassion, is it fair to judge you as a Trump voter by that standard? Let's take another one. We'll take another one from the right. Uh, welfare. Welfare is a system that, let's say it's not good. Uh, the Bible says, you know, man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. And we have this system that enables people to kind of enslaves them in a sense, right, to the, the dole. And uh, let's say you're against it. Let's say you want to progressively get rid of it. Uh, you're, you care about the condition of the people, though, that are receiving this aid. And so you become a welfare worker, and you're going to try to make sure that people aren't treated like numbers but human beings. Well, let's say that, uh, you know, again, years down the road, uh, there's a, maybe a Christian denomination and, and your family or, you know, become part of it. And, uh, and they have this belief that the welfare system is so wrong, how can you, someone who um, worked as a welfare worker, be a Christian? How can you do that? You know, that? You're assisting in this horrible system when in reality you were trying to take the commands of God and apply them to a bad situation to make it a little better. Uh, let's take one more example. Um, my head's being filled with them. This will be the last one, though. Let's talk about slave labor in the sense of uh, sweatshops and clothes that are purchased at like Walmart or Target you know, let's say you're benefiting, like Edwards was talking about, those who benefited from slave labor. You're benefiting from 
sweatshops from countries in which they still have slave labor, child labor, and you're against those things, but you know, you gotta, you gotta wear something and you don't have a lot of money. So you go out and you buy clothes and, and that's what you wear. Uh, what should people think about you? What should they think about you? Um, are you in sin specifically? Is there a chapter and verse to say you are in sin? I'm not going to answer these questions, but they need to be considered. And there's a lot more examples I can come up with, but this is what presentism does. And, and we're doing it to Edwards and, um, and Whitfield today, but tomorrow, who is it going to be? This acid eats everything. It really does. Uh, you know, it's going to end up being like no one before 2010 is going to be <laughs> deemed uh, moral because the standards just keep changing. And hopefully, you, you know, we recognize this. But I wanted to bring this to your attention. I, I, I think um, this is the way that if you are encountering someone who argues this way and, and this is the way it should be handled, ask questions, get them to think about what they're really saying and get them to try to understand where their source of authority is coming from. And are they judging things in the past based on ethics from the Bible, the Word of God that transcends these barriers of time? Um, or are they judging things just based on you know what the cultural flavor around them is? Um, it, it's it's worth or is it a, is it a mix? You know, it's it's worth asking these questions. I think if we're going to be honest with ourselves, if we're going to try to be true to Scripture, we can't view Edwards and Whitfield the way Kyle J. Howard views them as heretics. And if we're going to be honest with Scripture and true to it, we can't view Martin Luther King Jr. the way that so many Christian churches and institutions are propping him up right now either. So I'll leave that there. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it helps. God bless.